really the passion sort of kicked in when I joined a go-kart track. <laughs> the one thing that a lot of people don't know, we opened Simply Raised because we couldn't get a bank loan. Um, so we opened it with £50 in the bank, not knowing if we were able to pay the next rent. We were actually refused like three different buildings because they didn't understand the business concept as well. Customers were coming in regularly um, because they saw racing drivers starting to use us. Four-time touring car champion is uh, Colin Turkington. He's good friends with us. Um, there's been a couple of occasions where he stuck it on pole position just after being at Simply Race, which is great. Very surreal moment when you've got Mr. Delara and Mario Andretti just sat next to each other as they come in and you're organising the production. Yeah, yeah. So I held uh, one ex Formula One driver, um, which was uh, David Brabham. So look after uh, sort of the esports program with him. Um, I did at one point look after Jensen Buttons and Chris Boncombe's brand Rocket. But a lot of people don't know that bit as well. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Georgie's Stripping the Dipping podcast. I'm your host, F1 Black. This week's episode will surely go down as one of my favourites. Today's guest, Mike Yao, was at the vanguard of sim racing. So much so, as you heard in the intro, that when he was setting up his business, people had no idea what sim racing was. A decade of hard work has proven his gamble right. So, if you're interested in hearing the story behind one of the UK's leading sim racing venues, frequented by professional drivers, might I add, then this episode's for you. So, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Mike Yao to the show. Mike, how are you doing? I'm well. Uh, nice to meet you. Really keen to get into what you're doing now in the world of sim racing. Um, but where did it all start? Going back to your first motorsport memories, what were they? Uh... I actually came into motorsport quite late, to be honest with you. Um, I basically, I think the first real memory was 11, 1996, Belgium Grand Prix, cars flying off turn one uh, and crashing due to the wet weather. Um, and then really the passion sort of kicked in when I joined a go-kart track um, back in Manchester. So I actually was at uni at the time um, and did part-time work there. Um, flipping burgers actually I wasn't actually on the track itself so I was actually just watching go-karts go round and round uh, in just a go-kart track and sort of worked my way through each department uh, so yeah that's sort of where it began and so sort of about 18 when it really kicked off for me yeah I mean who doesn't remember that Belgian Grand Prix where you know they're all running back to get the spare car as it were because they've just completely <laughs> destroyed millions of pounds worth of machinery um, they didn't care back then. I mean, they, they <laughs> their budgets were humongous. Um, I no. know they're big now, but wow, yeah, it was different then. Yeah, I think back then you'd have like, oh, here's my uh, practice engine. Here's my qualifying engine. Okay, I'll put a new engine in for the race. So, Yeah, it um, didn't matter back then. No, the exactly. It's, it's interesting that you talk about coming to motorsport late and uh, and your sort of route into it. Yeah, I was looking at kind of your CV and, and, and that car track was what? Daytona Motorsport. Is that right? It was, yeah. So it was actually in Manchester and mm. literally down the road from uh, a stone throw away from Old Trafford, Manchester United's football ground. Mm. Um, I got a part-time job just because I actually just needed one. I, I was working in a bar at the time, which um, one of my dad's friends owned, um, and I just needed to top up my income. So essentially I was working, I think, Saturday evenings and Friday evenings uh, oh, sorry, it was Saturday and Sunday at the restaurant. So I'd finish at midnight and then go back in at 10 a.m. Um, at the restaurant just to do bar work. Um, and also pushed in some trolleys as well. So <laughs> my background's very peculiar once we get back in, once we really delve into it a bit. Um, and then I think at the time I'd met my uh, seemed to be wife. Um, we decided that I needed to do sort of up my income and found Daytona. Uh, I think I applied for the receptionist role, actually. So front of house, I just I didn't want to be anywhere near catering because through through growing up, uh, my family had restaurants and takeaways, and uh, every time every weekend came, I really didn't have another life but just to work and help the family out, um, which is fine. And it, it sort of grounded me to where um, and what I wanted to do. Actually, grounded me from where I am now to what I wanted to do. Um, and then through Daytona, I basically did, they brought me in because of the catering background, of course, I was slipping burgers, uh, I was wearing, um, 
the checkered flag trousers as well to go with it and the uniform uh, and a hat. Uh, and yeah, just serving drinks and serving serving the customers. So essentially, uh, I, I'll always remember that job and I'll always remember the owner because he helped me out throughout that period. The way that I asked for a job to basically move through the departments was actually, um, it was late at night, an event had finished. The owner was there, sat there having a beer. I served him and he asked me what I wanted to do with my life, which is always interesting when someone asks you that. And I essentially just said, yeah, I want to I want to learn this business. I want to go through every department and I want to be on track. I want to be there. I want to be a marshal. I want to wave a flag. Uh, I want to then look at the reception area. Then I actually went through this period where I went through everything, engineering, learn how to rebuild uh, a car engine, learn about the sprockets and the clutch and understanding sort of why certain things did what they did on the cart. Um, the, how often we bent chassis, bent axle, track rod bends, um, and then went into the administration side of it more as well. So then did the administration for the company, that all the accounts, um, and helping the FD at the time uh, with uh, event analysis to know where all the income was coming in and out. Really delved, you know, into the PL and the management with them as well. Um, I then, so that was back in 2005, six, no, 2004, sorry, when I joined. 2003, 2004 when I joined. And then 2006 is when they uh, offered me a position uh, as assistant manager. Um, and then a year later, I then became general manager um, with someone else at the time. So we became your general manager because I was so young, they were a bit concerned that uh, I might not <laughs> have the skill set at the time. Um, and then a year later, I then took over as, as the main GM um, and had been there for many years until I think I went back to university in 20, what was it, 2000 and Oh, this is testing me now. I was 23. So I'd been there four years at that point and then went back to university because I didn't complete the first year. Um, ironically, I didn't complete the second year. The first time, the second time I went back, I just completed my transcripts for the first year and they offered me a job in Milton Keynes. Took that and um, opened up the venue. So the one thing that I didn't sort of allude to when the reason why I got offered the job in Milton Keynes was actually because um, I generated them making a loss every year to their first profit um, by changing the way that we operate, uh, just by changing a few little things um, with direct costs, suppliers, um, and just renegotiating contracts, essentially. Um, and I was only 20, yeah, so between 21 and 24, yeah, those three years is when I was general management, like really delving into negotiating, understanding contracts, licensing. Um, and customer experience, that was the biggest thing that I took away from it, is how the customer's experience from walking through the door to when they exited, it's like every, there was always a step, every process. And it's something that I took away, um, and hence why I was there, I was thanked them, uh, because essentially that's what kept me going in the hospitality industry um, along the way. That created Simply Race. The Milk Teens job I took, um, and... Yeah, left left my wife at that point in terms of left her in another city, um, <laughs> and then and then came uh, to Milton Keynes, uh, took over the Daytona Milton Keynes site. Um, youngest general manager at the time, I was twenty four, turning on twenty five. Um, I'd only stayed there for eighteen months, and the reason being is that actually, I the one thing that I said during the time was if it started affecting my marriage at the time, I would. Um, walk away and that's what I did um, we did we then had a child um, and I've got a 12 year old boy now uh, so I left that in 2011 um, and then had my son in 2012 um, I actually left that job and took a sizable pay cut 50% I took um, to move back home and I became assistant manager for Aldi supermarkets so completely out of the window motorsport left my life at that point um, it wasn't until uh, 2013, 2014, when my business partner sort of put an ad out um, on Facebook, a post, and went, I've got a business proposition um, and I'm willing to give up equity 
Um, has, would anyone like to invest? At this point, at Aldi, I was doing 100-hour weeks, so I was not spending any money. Um, they were going through their major growth uh, between 2011 and 2014, which meant that um, they were we weren't able to recruit staff members quicker than what we were putting stuff on the shelf, which was hilarious. Um, so we were doing long hours, uh, long days, five to six days a week. At the same time, you know, I had had a newborn son, um, so I, 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 and also reduced wages as well. So I had no choice. I had to stick it out. Did I enjoy it at first? I hated it. Like working in the supermarket um, was difficult, especially Aldi because of the um, sort of the fast-paced nature and understanding the business. Because so, you, when you come from corporate hospitality, everything's a little bit more slow-paced. Everyone enjoys being there. Whereas shopping is a necessity. So you don't <laughs> basically have the ability to enjoy the moment. You, you're there because it's a necessity. You need those things. Um, and Aldi has a wide range of um, people that come through the door as well. So you're dealing with all walks of life, um, which makes you grow uh, quite some thick skin because you <laughs> you can be treated very differently to what I was being treated before. So um, it was very different. Um, however, it did get better. Um, I started opening stores. Um, I then started bringing in the computer-generated oper uh, operating system to reorder stuff automatically rather than everything being very manual. Um, then became store manager for a few stores after some training and also some um, other uh, projects. The one thing that I took away from that is basically I kept asking for projects. I was very greedy because of just wanting to learn constantly because it's the only way that I knew that um, just like anything in other job roles, you remain in the spotlight a little bit. Um, you have to fight for those things as well. So um, I was listening back to some of your podcasts, actually, uh, where Darren was talking about, Darren Cox talked about how things only really happen with people that sort of drive things forward and sort of rebel against the norm. And it was something that I constantly did within that uh, company. It's just trying to understand what I could push forward within the, the means that I had at the time as a store manager. Uh, so I was always trialing stuff, re reordering rotors. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, Aldi was very all about uh, direct costs um, with the hours that you used. Um, it's the way that they sort of negotiated your, your, your commission in some sense or bonuses each month. So the more you sort of did, um to save money the more that you sort of got in return which was great as a store manager because ultimately same again you know I, i'd quit a job um with good pay with good benefits and um aldi sort of returned that favor which was great however with that i was working full-time 48 hour contract and decided to open up simply race with ben Ben did all the hours. I'm not going to lie. He he did the legwork. He did all the hard work. I was <laughs> I felt like a bit of a consultant at times. Um, it was nice to be back in motorsport. So that was uh, definitely something um, to sort of push forward. Um, we then, with that, we a lot of people don't know this, but we were actually behind a lot of the tech support for the world's fastest gamer. Mm. Um, so if you if you delve into the Simply Race website and search World's Fastest Gamer, you'll know that the team behind it was actually Ben and some colleagues as well from Simply Race. So we actually were running that in the background. We were running the Sims, we were running the um, R Factor 2 program uh, just because we ran it at the venue as well. Um, and that sort of leap from my business partner and them forward which meant that i then moved into operations for the business but that wasn't until i just sort of uh what's the word i'm looking for time out of aldi and going into haberdashery at hobbycraft <laughs> as a territory manager uh which was interesting i joined uh hobbycraft a haberdashery is basically knitting sewing painting clay um, and also I joined as the slime phase was in. So I don't know if you ever remember that. That was basically PVA glue, but hundreds of it, and kids making little slime pots of different colours, beads, glitter. Yeah, I, I was part of that, and parents were going mental coming in buying five-litre bottles of PVA glue. 
Sounds like chaos. As a parent, I'm not sure I can endorse this. I don't want any of PVA glue in my house. Keep it at Hobbycraft. But yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was quite funny, but it, I think people were actually selling it as well. So people were being very entrepreneurial at that point. Ah. Um, but it was good to see. Um, it, it definitely taught me um, some business lessons whilst I was there in terms of they, they managed very uh, closely on sort of the stock um, rotation and also with the difference in what was going on um, at Etsy, for example, or Pinterest. They were trying to follow those particular ideas. And it's mm. no different than sort of influencers in motorsport. So people are following what Red Bull are doing, for example, on their particular car and trying to copy them. Back in the day, it used to be Mercedes. And it, it's, it's the same thing. It, all it is, it's just a different industry, uh, different business, but it essentially comes down to the bottom line. What I'm hearing here is like a load of hard work, dedication, and a desire to learn. So where do you think that comes from in you? Uh, I think, I don't know, probably just growing up, to be honest with you. Um, my A lot of people think that where I came from was, you know, I had a decent education and, and I grew up in a nice area and whatnot, but actually it's a bit removed from the truth i we lost our home back in when i was 10 um we lived in a hostel for a few months and in, in different locations um one bedroom um there was five kids and my mom um my dad was working away trying to just make ends meet um we moved i think it was two or three different hostels three different hostels because we had a temporary hostel at one point as well uh, missed, I missed school for two to three months as well, just because we weren't able to register in certain schools. Um, and then we eventually got a council house, three bedrooms for six of us uh, to live in um, at the time. So my, my dad lived away um, working for a company and then in restaurants. And my mom basically took care of us at the time. Uh, so we we had to model through so hence why I never want to go back to that point in my life um, and just sort of the reason for learning was trying to help and I wasn't I'm very I'm not the greatest academic however I'm I'm very hands-on so I will still try and learn as much as I can um, but I'll try and read as well a little bit so as much as I can as well taking what I can but in regards to sort of where I think it came from. A lot of it comes from my dad just pushing on. It's essentially he had six kids. I know I've got three sisters, two brothers. Um, all very fortunate. We all have good good jobs. We've all worked and we're very competitive. Um, it's just a cultural thing, I think. Um, super competitive. We sort of yeah, talk about everything, but yeah, it ultimately comes down to who who can who can win. I don't know why. It's just uh, something we've always had. Um, and just desire to, uh, yeah, we're not greedy. And I think that's the biggest thing is that we haven't been greedy. And it's something that we carry on in Simply Race as well. It's, we, we're there to make a living, but we're not there to, like, we're not there to make millions. I'm, I'm not too concerned about that right now. As long as I'm comfortable, I don't have to worry about um, where the next paycheck comes from. And, I just want to just just remain happy as it were. I think that's, that's probably the best way to explain it. No. But a lot of people don't know that bit as well. A lot of people don't know about my, my growing up. Well, thanks for sharing it. And I think our upbringings do have a huge impact on us. And, you know, every guest we've had, there's been, you know, often something that may, gives them a drive that is in some ways like superhuman or that, that propels them to where they end up. Um, so you... Before we talk about Simply Race, you mentioned that you end of a shift, end of an event, the owner of Daytona was sort of saying, oh, what, what do you want to do? And you said, oh, I want to learn this business. Was he, was he the sort of guy that was just asking that question out of curiosity? Or do you think he sort of saw something in you? And, you know, clearly it sounds like that was your sort of inverted commas apprenticeship. So, like, yeah, how, how did you have the audacity to say, I want to learn this business? And what do you think made him say yes? I think he could tell that I was either going to leave or learn one of the two <laughs> so he decided uh well well uh, he said uh, at the time it was jolly and i always remember jolly a great guy still friends with him he basically told him that I, he needs to put me in different departments and see how i get oh that was it so yeah i think it was just me being a little bit forthright just saying i want 
I, I want to do something different. I don't want to be stuck behind here. I mean, I'm, I'm wasted behind here. Um, and yeah, lucky on me, it's just, yeah, just push forward. And you, you do have to go out and, and ask and take it um, if you want something. And I think that's why I did what I did. Um, I just said it. I think I was just like, I, this is my opportunity. It's the only time I'm going to get. So I just said it. No, of course. And I think often the moments we regret is when we don't say it. Uh, so yeah, clearly that had a huge impact. And then, so we're talking about Simply Race. You mentioned, and yeah, I'm thinking about what was the last time I was on Facebook. It's probably just to remember birthdays at this stage. But you say that your current business partner posted, like, I've got this business proposition. Like, I, I don't know. I, I am maybe less trusting than you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, if someone said, oh, I've got a business proposition, what, what made you think, okay, this is legit. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm up for investing in this. Like, how, how did that come about and, and how trusting were you? Well, it did help. I was his boss at one point. You knew him? Yeah, I'd known him for a long time uh, prior. So um, I've known him since he was in university, actually. So he was in uni. Um, I basically was his boss at Daytona Milton Keynes. Um, ironically, he then became the youngest general manager to take over Daytona Milton Keynes. So uh, hence why I sort of knew his background and pedigree and, and sort of knew that if he was going to do something, he's going to do something well uh, with the same mindset. Um, and he has gone on. He's gone on to now be a VP of a blue chip company. Um, he's got other business acquisitions. Yeah, it's not just what we have uh, with Simply Race. Um, so definitely uh, we're on to a winner. So the, we, I basically just picked up the phone to him, to be honest with you. I literally just go, said to him, let's have a chat. And he told me the idea, which was ironic because I had the same phone call probably about two years earlier with someone else, but I didn't have the knowledge base or the capital at the time. So I said to him, what did you want? He told me a figure. I said, okay. Originally, it was 10% of the company. Um, and then... Out of nowhere, it then became 40% because I ended up putting more money than I expected to, uh, which was great. It was fine. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> the one thing that a lot of people don't know, we opened Simply Raised because we couldn't get a bank loan. Um, so we opened it with £50 in the bank, not knowing if we were able to pay the next rent. Wow. And also <laughs> no, would you describe yourself as, because it sounds like you're putting in the hard work, but would you also describe yourself as someone that like backs yourself? Because you know, that's clearly like a bit of a gamble, albeit with your effort on the table. Yeah, I mean, I, I I trusted Ben quite a lot. Um, don't get me wrong, my the wife at the time, she she said to me, "Are you sure? Are you really sure this is going to work?" I was like, "Yeah, I've got yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it'll work, it'll work." Um, and it was it's definitely <laughs> a tight time. We we I actually put all of the what well, I think I put part of the assets on my house against my house at the time uh, which was a huge gamble because they needed a guarantor and I didn't have the working capital and plus the business not having any background in numbers or anything like that and we were we're two fresh faced guys just starting up something that no one understood as well we were actually refused like three different buildings because they didn't understand the business concept as well so to, to you now you may be thinking, really? You don't understand sprint racing? But actually, when you think 2014, 10 years ago, not many people did. There was less than 10 simulator venues in the UK, across the UK as well. Um, and the way that I used to describe it is early 80s, where people really didn't understand go-karting. So go-karting had been around for years, but people only ever thought it was for the really, really rich. Uh, didn't know where to go to go and get a go-kart or a license to race that go-kart um and sim racing was exactly in that same um sort of era um it's only covid sort of coming around where it sort of propelled it into the faces of everyone with Le Mans virtual um and, and sort of the other events apologies dog barking in the background um luckily i didn't hear it so you know we've oh. introduced your dog brilliant welcome <laughs> what's the name <laughs> of your dog <laughs> jace jace um, okay. apologies <laughs> though I, I, i'm glad that you can hear that yeah. um and yeah so basically in covid sort of helped 
sort of propel that. But at the same time, Simply Raised was closed, so it was a very difficult time um, for us. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where Ben and I sort of got together and, and started the brand. Um, it started off with 10 simulators as well in Milton Keynes in a mm. 3,000 square foot building. <laughs> so it was quite empty. <laughs> were they all so, together or did you space them out a bit? Or <laughs> well, there, there, there were there were five on each side because it was mm. a rectangular building. Um, but when you walked in, it was super imposing. Yeah, mm. it was empty. I mean, we had pictures on the walls as much as we could fill. We stole uh, home his mum's sofa, a three-seater and a two-seater sofa. We bought some IKEA tub chairs um, and some little coffee tables. But and and we, I know Ben built the podium as well. So, but it was it was sparse. I mean, yeah, it was. It basically we we opened it with uh, what we had mm. and just tried to make it work. And uh, thankfully, it was received well. Um, Otherwise, I won't be here talking about it. So let me ask you a question here, right? Because clearly, yeah, you said people were sort of uh, quizzical about this idea and, you know, weren't sure about it. Look, I grew up in, like, I was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s. I can still remember Sega Rally, yeah, Toyota Celica jumping over the little thing and it says start, you know, you put your 50p in. So what elevates that into sim racing? What what kind of is the standard that says, I'm no longer in a kind of Sega park or an arcade. Look, see, I'm showing my age uh, and I'm actually in a sim racing venue. Yeah, so that was always the difficult bit at the very start, even with customers. Um, we had a customer, um, they <laughs> But ironically, they were at a Porsche uh, event um, and they said that they queried a birthday party, which was, I think at the time we were charging £13.50 per child for a an hour party. And he came back to me and said, oh, you're, you're very expensive. And I had to sort of allude to the fact that we weren't, you're not paying for an arcade machine. You're not. You you are paying for the ability to race a car and track that you wouldn't be able to in real life, um, and being able to experience that differently. And we we had to sort of remind people that you, you would have to drive on the simulators as if you were driving a real car. Otherwise, um, if you kept saying it was a game in your head. Um, you wouldn't enjoy the experience because you'd just like the expectancy to go around a corner with it on rails um, like you would do on a Daytona arcade machine, for example, when you're doing the ovals, et cetera, like that, which is quite funny. So um, it was definitely educating the public. It was definitely the hardest bit, especially for the first few years. Once we got to a position two years in, we sort of got more and more acceptance and also customers were becoming in regularly um because they saw racing drivers start to use us so there was you know the racing drivers were coming in real world ones and actually using us for muscle memory just for the tracks they didn't know if they hadn't been to a certain circuit before they would practice with us and then head off and we still get that to, the, to this day we have a lot of people come to the center just to do some muscle memory um you're never going to get it exact because of course you can't mimic inertia you know if you can have motion but there's certain elements that you're never going to get with the g-forces and that is something that we sort of play on a little bit we, we use real world drivers to help with our rd with the setups of the sims to make sure they feel as much uh, or as close as they could possibly could do with the real cars and it's something that we sort of push forward as well in our sort of marketing campaigns, let them know that we do work with real world teams, real world drivers, and what you're getting is real world data out there, out the these simulators these days as well. So it's a lot, lot closer than it used to be. However, the other flip side of it is that we also make sure that when you do come and drive a sim, it's not 100% going to be 100% accurate because if it is, you probably won't enjoy the experience because you probably always put it in a wall. So we, we do make very safe sort of um, setups on, on the actual sim rigs themselves to make sure the public are enjoying them because we are math market rather than uh, very uh, ISO and F, which is sort of more to do with driver performance and development. No, of course. And like, so my wife surprised me for my birthday. I won't say the year that I'm celebrating, but it was earlier this month. We went to the F1 arcade down in 
like bank, St. Paul's in London. And yeah, the five different modes you can be on. And I went with my two young sons as well, who are six and nine. So six-year-old, not quite reaching the pedal, but doing his best. Um, and yeah, you could have it on the kind of easiest setting and it would pretty much be on rails. But as soon as you start moving up, like the thing that got me was putting my foot down out of a corner. If I was not very, very careful, I would just spin immediately. Like it would just spin up. So you're right. Like it must be painfully irritating <laughs> to have the setting on exactly what Lewis Hamilton feels under his right foot. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. We have that with um, drivers all the time. So they would come in and just say the car's under steering more because that's how you generate, a, a, sorry, that's how you build a safer setup for the public because a lot of people tend to overcorrect um, or they'll turn the steering wheel full full uh, lot as most people do. Yeah, just imagine it. You just want to turn and you want it to just go. But in real in real world terms, it, your car doesn't do that. So why would you do that on a simulator? So we, there, there's sort of a fine balance um, that we work with, especially with the leisure industry as a whole, especially when you've got kids. You know, we deal with a lot of children um, from the age of seven um, through to 14. And a lot of those younger kids, some are great and some just – still think it's a game so it, it there's a yeah we just have to make sure that they're aware and we give a lot of advice whilst we're sort of teaching the kids whilst they're on the simulators and well not just the kids actually the adults as well you know we give them a lot of coaching and yeah that's definitely something you know people don't listen to uh their peers but sometimes they'll listen to us because it makes more sense when we're telling them yeah, like I think I'm probably the sort of person that would be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'll just do it. And then, yeah, it took, we had, um, I think five races. It's probably like a standard sort of F1 sim package. And by the final race, I'd had, I had it on pro and I was making mistakes. I was, I was catching the pack and I was there and then I'd just make a quick mistake. But I know for a fact that if someone had said, oh, do be careful, like the first time I sat down to do it, I would just have not listened and, and driven off. So, you mentioned that you had 10 simulators when you started. And am I right in thinking this was in, this is in Milton Keynes, right? Or have I made that up? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. yeah. So you're in the motorsport triangle. You start with 10 sims. Um, you talked also about, like, you were thinking when you're at Daytona about the experience from when they walk in to when they walk out. So, can you describe that experience now? Are you in the same venue? How's it changed? And, and what is it like as you walk in? Yeah, we actually moved out of that particular um, unit in 2020 December. So we, we gave the keys back because the landlords um, during COVID actually increased our rent by 25%. <laughs> so we, we didn't have a choice. We were like, okay. Um, and at the same time, when our rent review was due, um, I decided to go out because we had a break clause anyway. So we thought, actually, year six, we could just walk away if, we don't, if we're not happy anymore. Luckily, the guys over at 12th Street, which is central Milton Keynes, we're next to Ski Centre, we're opposite Pop World, uh, a nightclub, which is sort of good and bad, I guess. Um, we've got the theatre, we've actually got the shopping centre near us, so we get a lot of passing trade. Um, so we decided to move, and we actually moved to central Milton Keynes in, and opened the door, reopened the doors in May 21, yep, 2021. Um, and then from there, we haven't looked back. That you, the experience itself, um, you come into the venue, you're greeted at the desk immediately from one of the members of the staff, and they guide you through everything from the beginning to the end. So they'll ask you to sign in. Um, we don't take many details, but your name, your email, we don't even take unless you want your email, uh, sorry, all your data sent out. Um, otherwise, you just put your full name. So you just put your first and last name and we don't take anything else. Um, the reason for that is your lap times are then allocated to your name and your driver profile, as it were. Um, you then jump onto the website at simplyrace.co.uk, click on lap data. You then type your name in that you gave to us. And every single lap that you've ever completed at the venue since 2016 in September, we have all this data, um, is now available. And on top of that, if you click the little graph that's next to your name, it will give you your telemetry data. So it'll give you your speed through the corners, um, your braking, your steering input, your acceleration input um, on your pedals. And also it'll compare your lap against the best lap time ever in that car and track combination as well. So 
we we provide all the data available from the platform. Um, and what we do whilst we're up, the drivers are on site is basically teach you how to um, go back out. So you'll do a 20 minute session, for example, that'll cost you 1150. However, if you want to go out for another 20 minutes, it won't cost you another 1150, it'll cost you 950. Um, and then the price goes down the more time you take. So it's 2650 an hour, which is less like less than half the price of go-karting. Um, and we break it up to three 20 minute segments. So you come in, you have your session, you come off, the race director uh, or the other member of staff will come to you, ask you if you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, you can either carry on with the car and track combination you've got, or we will actually change that car and track combination if you're struggling, or if you found it too easy, we'll, we'll, we'll up the ante as it were. Throughout that period, we, we would be watching each of the drivers to just double check they're okay, they're enjoying themselves, they're making sure that um, it's almost like you feel like you're being uh, looked after by an engineer throughout. You know, someone's there to make sure that um, you're well fed, well watered, and also you're being, you're, you're being taught how to drive the simulators in a manner that makes you enjoy it and go quicker at the same time. And that was the biggest sort of key part that we always implement within Simply Race is, is, is the experience from sort of start to finish. So at the end of your session, we'd give you, um, we generally wouldn't print off anything anymore because of the paper waste and also environmental stuff. Um, but what we do do is sort of bring up the website on, we've got uh, two 65-inch screens behind the desk and also two 75-inch um, monitors up on the wall. So we'd actually bring your data up so you could compare against uh, the other drivers um, and sort of teach you how to sort of read the telemetry data that's coming out as well. Um, we have a lot of drivers come back just to beat their laptop. That purely that's what they come down for. They don't actually come for like the uh, trying to beat their mate, as it were. It was always just about about the lap time. So you tend to have a lot of customers come in driving one particular car, one particular track, and they'll just do it for an hour. Nurburgring is probably the worst for it though, because you you have to have a lot of time. So when you're driving a yeah. full Nurburgring circuit, Norschleifer, um, we uh, we actually run uh, a Monday night session where it's just two hours straight. You don't get off. You can stop when you want, but you literally just have two hours just to just pound laps. And a lot of drivers come to us to do their site recce or their lap um, before they head out to the Nurburgring themselves in their real cars. So that, that's one thing a lot of people don't know. That's fascinating. And you, I was thinking earlier when you were saying about that data that it would make me obsessed. You, you are a very smart guy. Uh, you know, like repeat custom, like the percentage must be incredible. Um, <laughs> so so you mentioned having some actual professional drivers, uh, particularly in the early days or as you built through, coming and just using it for muscle memory. Would there, were there any that, you know, you could share the name of that we might have heard of or are you, is it kind of oh, like yeah, keep yeah. it quiet? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, current existing British touring car, um, four-time touring car champion is uh, Colin Turkington. He's good friends with us. Wow. He, he comes down periodically, probably a week before he's due to be on track. Um, Grant, who's the general manager who looks after the venue on our behalf, he he is essentially his data engineer for his practice sessions. So when he wants to make a particular change on the car, because we have his three series um, within the simulator, so we we had it built previously, but now Studio Three Nine Seven actually created the actual mod, oh, not the mod, the actual car itself. Sorry. Um, so he can make intricate detail, toe, camber, um, suspension, rebound, um, and power, power bands as well. So we can sort of give him less or more boost on the hybrid, um, on the push to, push to pass button. So what Grant does with Colin is, is quite detailed. Um, they, they sit down, they analyze what track they've got coming up, they analyze the weather, and then they'll set up the server based on uh, temperatures and the weather and also track temp as well so to make sure that we're sort of mimicking everything that I could possibly um, have out there. Um, there's been a couple of occasions where he stuck it on pole position just after being at Simply Race which is great um, and he modified the car in real world to be the same feeling as he got on the sim as well so it yeah it, it does work it just um, you need to hear it from the horse's mouth though because he does come to us quite a bit um, so if you, there is a, a YouTube um, video somewhere. So if you sort of search it, Colin Turkington, Simply Race, ITV, um, it, should, it should pop up. 
Oh, we'll definitely look that up. And I'm obsessed uh, with uh, your venue now. And uh, so my co-host, Dens, is a bit of a sim racer. He's going to be offended that I say a bit of a sim racer. He's sort of won, I think, the Daytona 24. He's won his class in Le Mans. He was recently invited to the sort of uh, AMG Mercedes. I'm going to not do it justice, but basically had a sim racing event. He was in the sort of second division and, and won won that race. So he, so I'm going to say to him, look, right, let's let's drive up to Milton Keynes and, uh, you know, I, he'll smash me, but, you know, I'll at least wind him up on the way there. Um, so, like, tell us a bit about, is, am I saying, is, is it AK Esports or is it pronounced altogether? It's an Italian company, but you're the UK CEO, is that right? Yeah, so AK Esports um, is a global um, brand. Um, so Alessio um, is sort of the group CEO. Um, I head up the UK arm um, with the London office. So the Italian office is Bergamo, um, but we now got a North America office with the Lara. So we we were run events with them. So we signed a contract uh, or inaugurated the company, sorry, in May. So just before the Indy 500. So I was out there with them, um, sort of to help um, with the production and also the setup and. Sorting out everything. Um, very surreal moment when you've got Mr. Delara and Mario Andretti just sat next to each other as they come in and you're organising the production with the commentators, etc. as well. So really great experience. Indy 500, I mean, if you ever got an event that you want to tick off that bucket list, um, please do, because it was it was something else. Um, the one thing that I did do was not hospitality. I actually, you know, um, got the offer to go on a grid walk and whatnot. I actually... Gave it to the commentator, which was great because it was a good experience for him. Um, and I did it like a spectator. I, I, went, I went to the grandstands. I, I did the uh, tailgate party where you have a drink before with the back of the trucks and stuff with people. Um, and then sat in the grandstand. So I was at turn three, um, literally uh, as, as the race uh, unfolded on the last corner, on the last lap. Um, and it was something surreal. You know, the fans being, being amongst everyone was fantastic. And, Definitely something a little bit different. But AK Esports in the UK essentially is event management in esports, uh, esports productions, so TV um, outputs and also including the streaming side, broadcast. Um, we also do simulator hire and activation at events, so such as exhibitions. So if you wanted um, a racing simulator branded uh, for argument's sake, we're working with the British Army at the moment. so. Uh, we would brand the entire simulator as um, British Army. Um, we would have their livery on the car as well um, within the game. Um, and then they would use that as an engagement piece, for example. So uh, for exhibitions, that would be um, the likes of like Sony or Samsung or whatever company you're working with. We would basically provide the simulator, uh, create a leaderboard for them, nice and shiny, um, or on an electronic board. and get people to set fastest laps and a lot a lot of the time you'd have a giveaway or a lot of people would just have it for fun so we were at the british motor show recently and we were just basically setting lap times and taking pictures with everyone and sticking it on the big screen uh, which was just a little good fun basically and that's what the ak esports uk side do but we predominantly cover all of the esports production for the ak group so we're responsible for that so we do the sro um esports series so it's currently the internet continental gt um challenge excuse me and we covered asia america europe uh previous years but prior to that for the last three years um, i was traveling with the sro circus for the endurance challenge in europe and on site we would bring 24 simulators um, where the real world drivers would race um for real world championship points along with 10,000. Uh, Euro prize money for the winner as well. So um, we did that, and then what the production side, and then what happened is that the real world drivers would then race the same circuit but in real world. So we do it virtually, and then real world as well. Um, so if you ever have a chance, look at the SRO um, Pro Sim, they called it. Um, so the drivers would basically, uh, oh sorry, GT Pro GT Sim. And the real world drivers would race for their points and win some money at the same time, which was which was great um, sort of spectacle because it was very different. No one in in history has done that where they raced virtually for real world championship points towards the championship or 
that particular race uh, or, or the actual global championship. So it was very different. Um, we've done a couple of Spa 24 hours um, and we also do online with the Nürburgring, which will be coming up next week as well. So lot, lot, lots to do. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're a busy guy. You know, I'm trying to figure out how you packed it all in. Um so um, a couple of questions as we bring the episode to a close, and this has been really fascinating, this kind of mix of your determination, the kind of hard work, desire to learn, and how you've ended up where you have with that kind of getting ahead of the, the rest uh, on, on sim racing. But going back to when you were go-karting, right, one of my beliefs is that, you know, all those people that work in the, uh, the karting center, when you can see when they're like bringing the carts back, you know, whatever, they're able to like spin turn that thing and just put it put it in position really quickly. So when they shut the doors, were you kind of going around? Did you kind of become quite a good little driver? You know, when you were in the the kind of track track side uh, there. Yeah, there was an element that I was not a, <laughs> not a bad carter, uh, to say the least. And to be honest with you, I actually got some uh, private backing to do some sort of corporate hospitality events and stuff we did like the 12 and 24 hour events um on different tracks and stuff with with friends well he actually became a very good friend and an investor for another company that i've got now but um he sort of asked me to join him one day and that was it so yeah you you do get the bug and you still want to race and i, I don't get me wrong i've had sort of ideas to get a race license now and actually jump in a car, real world car event but um I think uh, I want to go and buy a house first again. <laughs> I'll do that before I go and spend thousands or hundreds of thousands um, on, on real world racing. So, yeah, I need to. I'm holding myself back, but I don't know. I don't know how quick I'll be. Actually, that's another question. I think I think you'd even if you didn't start off very quick, you'd figure it out. It seems like you. I mean, obviously, some of it is about natural reflexes, but I'm sure the determination would be there. And and maybe at this point, it's kind of like. When you have too much of a good thing, you're like, oh, I can take it or leave it. But like when it's uh, sim racing, given that you started off with that 3,000 square foot venue, 10 simulators, when you started up and, and even now, do you pop in and like have a go yourself and, you know, beat your own time? Uh, no, I actually got simulator at home. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> I, I, I turned it on twice since I got it. Ah, okay. So, no, don't have time, unfortunately. <laughs> Busy guy. <laughs> yeah, I've got too much going on, unfortunately. I, I've also helped, you know, a couple of esports teams as well. So that's uh, with drivers and sponsorship and, oh, really? and stuff. So that, yeah, yeah. So I helped uh, one ex Formula One driver, um, which was uh, David Brabham. Oh, cool. Um, so look at so look after uh, sort of the esports program with him. Um, I did at one point look after Jensen Buttons and Chris Bonkum's brand Rocket. Um, hmm. So we sort of did that during just after COVID, as it were, and just, just we tried to sort of take leverage of the fact that esports was still there, but it, it just didn't correlate enough in terms of the brand pushing forward, and it was very mm. difficult. So it's still there. I mean, if you took, you know Google sort of Rocket Sim Sport, it's still around, uh, but it's just not. It's just idle at the moment. And then for the Brabham side, it's still sort of pushing forward and, and gaining a little bit of momentum because that's more to do with historical. Um, and legacy for for David. Um, he wants to keep that brand sort of known to sort of the next generation. A lot of people still, if you look back at history, don't know that he used to race in Formula One and what the name actually represents with his dad Jack winning the championship back in seventy. So we're still trying to drive that heritage side forward for him to the sort of the new audience. And esports seems to be sort of the, the best way to do it for him. Gosh, I haven't thought about that. I mean, clearly I haven't, and you have, but like, you know, you talked about a car and a track that you couldn't do in real life. And now you're talking about a year that you don't exist in and you could be there driving driving the car. That's, that's incredible. Um, before I, we ask our sort of usual end of interview question, and it seems like you've been doing your research, so, I, you know, uh, I'm intrigued about your answer. Um, is there anything you'd like to kind of leave our listeners with? Any any final messages? And, and obviously, where can we sort of follow what you get up to and what your ventures uh, are doing? Uh, I haven't got really any particular final message for the audience itself. I think uh, the one thing I'll say is if you want to get into most sport, there are other different avenues. You don't have to be the driver. You can be an engineer. If you can't be an engineer because of 
you're not great at maps. There's the other side of it. You know, you've got the content creation, you've got uh, graphic design. You know, a lot of people love the fact that you can design an entire livery and have that placed upon a car. Um, one one person in particular, Joyce Liveries, for example, he races in different categories, BMW or the Fun Cup, which is sort of the VW Beetles that race around in the Durant series. You've he designed liveries and he sort of was able to then afford to be able to go racing because of it. You know, he's wrapping people's cars, which is something that is, you know, a different type of business within motorsport. Um, you got the administration if you want to go become an ASN. So if you want to go and work for Motorsport UK, you can um, apply to be, a, you know, one of the sort of stewards, um, clerk of the course, and still be involved. I mean, if you want to do it voluntary and you're happy doing that, you can become a marshal as well. You know, everyone um, talks about the Orange Army and how they're sort of, without them, you, you can't really go racing as well. So, you know, there there are other means to get into motorsport. and and for myself, I did it very differently and very late on. You know, I've come in virtually to then go into the real world. So I help um, real world drivers with sort of sponsorship and acquisitions as and when I can, um, but also connecting brands as well that would look at real world motorsport, but they wouldn't look at virtual and, and the other way around. You know, there are certain brands that probably wouldn't, you wouldn't think of coming into the real world of motorsport um, that are sort of breaking into it now. Um, but yeah, that that's sort of the only thing I can probably say uh, for people to take away from this particular episode. I hope, um, yeah, hope that, hope that, hopefully that helps. No, brilliant, and and everyone get down Milton Keynes. You say it was Twelfth Street. Yeah, Twelfth Street. Um, I'm not sure if I should say anything. I'm not signed a contract yet, but I'm opening another venue. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. I'm, dot dot dot. I've just told you. Yeah, dot dot dot. <laughs> um, but uh, it uh, it should be. I hope open before the end of the year. So, okay. Uh, so yeah, look out for, for that stuff on uh, on our socials. Um, but yeah, if you ever want to follow what I'm getting up to, it's Mike Yao Eight on Instagram. I'm terrible with Instagram in that I have one with linked to my sort of account, but I'm always on Twitter or X. I'm never on Instagram, and then there are all these DMs that I don't reply to. Uh, there was a chap that we interviewed who said, "Oh yeah, would you, you know I might have some friends coming around the Williams." factory and i left him unread for a month i was ah damn it so i will be better on instagram at least you'll get one follower from this and i'm sure you'll get a few more as well um so it's come to the moment because you're you're a reluctant caterer right maybe that could be like your third autobiography you know you can't have one i don't want to do catering ended up you described it as flipping burgers uh start that was your first job in motorsport i guess I take yeah. it that, I mean, in motorsport, I've been to a few go-kart tracks. The hot dog seems to be the key staple. Was there the slice of pizza or was that a little bit too sophisticated for the venue? Oh, no, definitely not. We we served like beef, stroganoff and Ooh. Sort of, yeah, hot pots and all sorts of different okay. things. So no, 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 it wasn't. Uh, we actually only got a hot dog machine quite late on as well, thinking about it. So. You guys were too... <laughs> Too hearty, too kind of like, you know, earnest in your in the offer. So I guess then you are a culinary expert. I've undersold who you are, you know. So I, occasionally you'll eat, you'll eat pizza, I take it. Oh, yeah. I had one the other day. There we go. So question, and you know Mario Andretti, so, you know, he'll be listening. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Wow. You said that with uh, conviction. Is that something you stand I'm, by? I'm- I stand by it, but I haven't had it for a long time, probably about <laughs> 10 years, but <laughs> I'm not bothered. It's a fruit. Just enjoy it. <laughs> there you go. It's a fruit. Just enjoy it. That feels like a strap line. We need to have that somewhere. Well, look, Mike, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Guys, um, I, I think you'll agree that it's been a fantastic episode. And if you do, then drop us a, a thumbs up or a five-star review. Uh, I don't even know if they have that anymore because I'm stuck in 2009, but that's me. But wherever you are, give us your comments. Come and find us at Strip the Dip on all your social media delights. You'll see I won't reply to you on Instagram, but on X, I'll be straight straight in your mentions. Uh, so this has been F1 Blag. It's been a great pleasure to have Mike Yao with us. Until next time, good night.